After writing down the Einstein's equation describing a gravitational field, it is now time to check that for gravitational fields that are weak as well as time independent, these equations reduce to a form that is expected by Newton's law of gravitation. Taking the appropriate limit, in this case, that describes a weak and static gravitational field is often called a Newtonian limit or Newtonian approximation. So in what follows, we will see that in an appropriate Newtonian limit, these set of equations reproduces Newton's law of gravitation. Remember, for a weak gravitational field, the feature of a weak gravitational field that we had seen when we discussed geodesic equation earlier was that it could be described by a metric which is to the first order, to the leading order, a flat metric. If g mu nu were the metric that I would use to describe a weak gravitational field, then it could be approximated to leading order with the flat space metric, the Minkowski metric, eta mu nu. And if we consider the, the departure from flat space, that departure will be represented by a term h mu nu, where h mu nu again have as many components as g mu nu or eta mu nu have, but each of these components will be such that their magnitudes will always be less than one, much less than one in fact. Now when we say much less than one, we mean that any term involving two powers of h mu nu could be approximately taken to be zero. So the gravitational field that we are trying to describe is one which can be to leading order approximated to a flat space. Now if this has to be true at every point in space-time, it is necessary that this must be satisfied for every point in space-time, which in turn tells us that not only the components of h mu nu be much smaller than 1 in magnitude, but any derivative of such components be also have a magnitude which is much smaller than 1. So in whatever we do today, we will keep this, these conditions, these requirements in mind. For a gravitational field described by such a metric, in order to compute the Einstein tensor, we must first compute the Christoffel connection that results from this. Then the Riemann tensor, Riemann curvature tensor, then the Ricci tensor, and finally also the Ricci scalar R. Only after we compute the Ricci tensor as well as the Ricci scalar, we will be able to compute g mu nu because g mu nu is defined in terms of these two quantities as r mu nu minus half 
g mu nu into r. Let us begin by computing the Christoffel symbol gamma. The Christoffel symbol has a definition as we know given by 0 alpha divided by 2 into del mu g alpha nu plus del nu g mu alpha minus del alpha g mu nu. It is clear that if I substitute this metric for the terms inside the bracket, the derivative in each of those terms will act only on h mu nu because eta mu nu is a part which represents the flat metric which have all components independent of coordinates. They are constants. <coughs> Thus, the form of the Christoffel symbol becomes much simpler when we compute it for thus the derivative terms in the Christoffel symbol can now be replaced with derivatives of h. Coming to the term involving G rho alpha, a component of the inverse of the metric tensor, we know that that inverse takes the form eta rho alpha, eta rho sigma, eta alpha beta, h sigma beta. The second term is again proportional to the factor h. Thus, if I substitute this form for g rho alpha here, we are going to see that whenever all terms involving the second term in g sigma beta, Whenever, whenever it gets multiplied by the derivatives involving h inside the bracket can be taken to be 0 because they are all of order order of h square or smaller. Thus, it is good enough if I replace g rho alpha simply with eta rho alpha. So you see that the computation for gamma rho mu nu simplifies in this approximation. Next, we must compute the Riemann tensor components. The component R rho sigma mu nu of a Riemann tensor is defined in terms of the Christoffel symbol and its derivatives as del mu gamma rho sigma nu minus del nu gamma rho mu sigma plus gamma rho mu alpha gamma alpha sigma nu minus gamma rho nu alpha gamma alpha
mu sigma. Coming to the computation of such a Riemann tensor component for a metric of this form, we must first notice that the third and fourth terms in the Riemann te tensor has two factors of the Christoffel symbol. In the previous step, we had computed the Christoffel symbol component and we observed that every one of those components is proportional to a factor of derivative of h, which is a number much smaller than 1. Thus, the second term and third term, each of which involves square of a Christoffel symbol or two powers of Christoffel symbol is proportional to a term that is two powers in derivative of h, which again using the fact that derivative of h is also infinitesimal can be set to, be set to be zero. Thus, the computation of Riemann tensor also simplifies for this type of a metric. All that we have to calculate are the first and the second term. Substituting this expression in here, we see that the Christoffel symbol takes the form eta rho alpha by 2 del mu acting on the first term which is gamma rho sigma nu I must replace to compute the first term I must replace mu with sigma here and take the derivative of the resultant term that will give me replacing mu with sigma here del sigma of h alpha nu acted on with a derivative with respect to mu then in the next term I replace mu with sigma alpha acted on by del mu the next term also Similarly, del mu acting on del alpha h sigma nu minus coming here all I must do is to interchange the positions of mu and nu to get the next set of three terms into eta rho alpha by 2 into del replace mu with nu and nu with mu plus this remains the same as it involves interchanging mu and nu which just shift, flips the order in which the derivatives are acting making resulting in no change replacing mu with nu we get the next term times h sigma mu As we can easily see that the second and the fifth term cancels. They are one and the same term. And we are left with the remaining four terms. They take the form.
so that is the expression for Raymond Christoffel curvature tensor in terms of H. We could also obtain the Riemann tensor in its completely covariant form. To do that, we must in fact multiply this with a factor of g. But by noticing that r itself is proportional to derivatives of h, which are all of magnitude much less than 1, when I multiply it with, multiply it with g, I could ignore terms that involve products of h with these, with any of these. Thus, multiplying this with g amounts to multiplying it with eta alone. The completely covariant form of R has the form R rho sigma mu nu equal to eta rho beta r beta sigma mu nu which gives us by making use of the explicit expression for r one half of del mu del sigma whenever i multiply eta rho beta to eta rho eta beta alpha that is part of r beta sigma mu nu, I should get a, a factor of chronic delta involving rho and alpha, delta rho alpha. Summing over alpha, I would get terms that involves rho in those places where alpha appeared. So in the first term, I would get h rho nu. In the second term, I would get del mu del rho h sigma nu. The third term, it is going to be minus del nu del, del sigma h rho mu. And lastly, we will have del nu, del rho, h sigma mu. The next step is to compute the Ricci tensor r mu nu. The Ricci tensor r mu nu is defined as g mu alpha g mu rho g nu sigma r rho sigma where r rho sigma is given in terms of Raymond tensor components by identifying the first and the third indices by contracting the first and the third indices thereby summing over them and by identifying the second and fourth indices with appropriate values which here are rho and sigma rho and sigma now this has to be multiplied with a factor of metric tensor two factors of metric tensor but remember since the metric tensor has also a part which is proportional to h whenever the term involving h multiplies factors in r they will form products of h as well as its derivatives factors of h as well as its derivative as well as their derivative are known to be quantities of magnitude much smaller than 1. They are infinitesimal. Hence, those products can be set to 0. This helps us to write this expression in the form 
eta mu rho eta nu sigma within the approximation in which we are working. Now computing this from here, when we sum over the first and third indices, it amounts to replacing mu with a contravariant index alpha. Thus we get del alpha, del sigma is replaced with rho, h alpha, nu is replaced with sigma, minus del alpha, del alpha, sigma is replaced with rho, and nu is replaced with sigma, minus del sigma del rho times h here h is the quantity defined as eta alpha mu times h alpha mu in here and the last term del sigma del alpha h rho alpha. We could further simplify this expression by carrying out the summation over rho as well as sigma indices. This will give us r mu nu as half times del mu del alpha h alpha nu minus del alpha del alpha h mu nu minus del mu del nu h plus del alpha del nu h alpha nu. Here I have also introduced the notation h alpha nu which represents eta alpha beta eta nu rho h beta rho. The last quantity that we need to compute to calculate Einstein tensor is the Ricci scalar r which is defined to be g mu nu r mu nu which as we have seen before could be expressed as eta mu nu r mu nu for the case of a weak gravitational field. This would result in an expression by making use of uh, the expression on the right hand side for r mu nu half of del nu del alpha h alpha nu del alpha del alpha h minus 
del alpha del alpha h so that becomes two times a similar term results from the last the third piece and finally del alpha del nu del alpha del nu h alpha nu which is the same factor as what we have here cancelling away the factors of 2 we get the expression we get this expression for the Ricci scalar in terms of these two quantities now we are ready to write down the Einstein tensor which is G mu nu equal to R mu nu minus half of G mu nu R. Using the expressions for R mu nu and R in here and replacing G mu nu with eta mu nu for the same reasons as earlier, we get the expression for g mu nu to be half del mu del nu h alpha nu minus del alpha del alpha h mu nu minus del mu del nu h plus del nu del alpha h alpha mu minus half times eta mu nu times the Ricci scalar given here which is del mu del alpha h alpha nu minus del alpha del alpha h. The expression for Einstein tensor can be written in a more compact form in terms of another quantity. Observe that we could write the first term as del beta eta mu beta del alpha h alpha nu we could write half of this term also along with this as minus one half of eta mu beta eta nu alpha del beta del alpha h similarly we could pick the fourth term and write eta nu beta del beta del alpha h alpha mu minus the remaining half of the third term which is again minus half eta nu beta eta mu alpha del beta del alpha times h. Observe that I have made use of the fact that mu nu, indices mu and nu are completely symmetric in this expression for g mu nu and written the first half of it with one particular order of mu and nu 
and the remaining half of the third term with interchange of mu and nu, which makes no change to its value. In each of these terms, let's pick the first term out of this. The first term you could see can be written by pulling out a factor of eta or mu beta. of del beta del alpha of h alpha nu minus half of eta alpha nu times h. What I have done is to pull, pull out the factor of eta mu beta and also write the two partial derivatives outside the bracket, wherein each of them acts on whatever exists inside the bracket. Similarly, the next term can also be written as eta nu beta del beta del alpha h alpha mu minus half of eta alpha mu h. Similarly, I could now pick one half of this term and write it as del alpha del alpha h nu nu minus half of eta mu nu h by clubbing one half of it with the second term there. Then comes the last, the, the fifth term, which also will be written now as del beta del alpha h alpha beta minus half of eta alpha beta del of h wherein I have clubbed the remaining half of the last term with the previous term to write it again in this form all of which is multiplied by a factor of eta mu nu. So we have managed to write all the six terms in this in terms of one particular factor which we can identify to be the same factor appearing in all these four expressions. Observe that there is a common half factor sitting outside in every term. Taking into account the existence of a factor of half as well as the relative signs in different terms, I can now write the expression for g mu nu as first term divided by half plus the second term divided by half which comes from here and then the third term with a relative minus sign multiplied by half again and lastly the fourth term which also comes with a relative minus sign times a factor of half. Now, by defining h alpha beta minus half eta alpha beta h to be a quantity h bar alpha beta, we see that the Einstein tensor can be expressed completely in terms of h bar alpha beta and g mu nu equal to half of eta mu beta del alpha del beta 
each alpha new bar each bar alpha new plus eta new beta del alpha del beta each bar alpha mu minus half of del alpha del alpha h bar mu nu minus half of eta mu nu times del alpha del beta h bar beta alpha now we have written the einstein tensor g mu nu in terms of the quantity h bar with a certain purpose that purpose will become clear once we understand one important property of small gravitational field that is the following consider a coordinate transformation from the x mu that we were using up till now to x prime mu which is given in terms of x mu by a by an addition of an infinitesimal infinitesimally small number psi mu which are functions of the coordinate x mu where x stands for in general all the coordinates x0 x1 x2 and x3 if we consider coordinate transformations of this type where remember psi mu is a quantity whose magnitude is much less than 1 then we can find out what kind of change the metric would undergo when i do this coordinate transformation the metric tensor g mu nu is also expected to go to g prime mu nu where g prime mu nu will be given as is well known using the transformation of a second rank covariant tensor del x rho by del x prime mu del x sigma by del x prime nu to g rho sigma but by realizing that in our case g rho sigma was of the form eta rho sigma plus h rho sigma and the fact that by doing an infinitesimally small coordinate transformation and going to a new coordinate x prime mu the metric that you would get g prime mu nu also has to be of the same form g prime mu nu being equal to eta mu nu plus some other infinitesimally small variation or departure from the flat metric represented by h prime because it is in the new coordinate system mu nu we could substitute these for on either side of the transformation equation for the second rank tensor and obtain a relation between h prime mu nu and h mu nu which is of the form as you can easily see by inverting this relation using it here minus del mu psi nu minus del nu psi nu so the conclusion that we can draw from this exercise is that under a change of coordinate as considered here 
the departure or the fluctuation of the metric, the variation of the metric from the space, flat space part undergoes a change as shown by this or as shown in this equation. Let's now compute the components of the Riemann tensor in the new coordinate system. To do that, let's remember that the expression for R for a metric of this form was one half of del mu del sigma h rho nu minus del mu del sigma h rho mu minus del mu del rho h sigma nu plus del nu del rho h sigma mu. If we substitute for h rho, rho nu from this expression by remembering that h nu nu is nothing but eta nu rho eta nu sigma h rho sigma and also defining psi mu as eta mu rho psi rho we can easily see that in the new coordinate system r prime rho sigma mu nu the component of Riemann tensor that we com compute in the new coordinate system r prime rho sigma mu nu will turns out to be identical to r rho sigma mu nu which was its value in the old coordinate system. Now this equation shows that the components of Riemann tensor turns out to be the same in coordinates x mu as well as x prime mu. If components of Riemann tensor remains the same then it, it is expected that quantities like Ricci tensor or Ricci scalar or even Einstein tensor all of which are derived from the Riemann tensor will also stay invariant will also remain the same under such a coordinate transformation. This provides us with a freedom in fact to work in the convenient set of coordinates. Now using this freedom we will choose a particular coordinate x prime in which we have a particular h prime mu nu such that if we consider this quantity h prime mu nu minus half eta mu nu h prime where h prime is eta mu nu h prime mu nu this quantity is what we earlier called h prime bar mu nu Now we will choose these coordinates in such a way that the h bar prime that results from such a coordinate transformation which is the quantity that will appear in the expression for g prime mu nu the Einstein tensor will satisfy the following condition h bar prime mu nu taken a covariant divergence del mu of h, pri h bar prime mu nu this is the divergence of h bar prime mu nu for divergence of h bar prime mu nu is zero. So let me repeat again we are doing a coordinate transformation such that it results in an h bar prime mu nu 
which satisfies this condition. We are choosing this condition especially because we know that it is this h bar prime mu nu that will appear in the expression for g prime mu nu expressed in written using the coordinate x prime. Now the expression for g prime mu nu can be easily seen by replacing the factors of h bar in this with h bar primes. After doing that, we could observe the following. If h bar prime were to obey this condition, which amounts to having its four divergence to be zero, then out of the four quantities that makes up the Einstein tensor, three will go to zero. For instance, the first term has a covariant divergence del alpha h bar alpha nu. The second again has a covariant four divergence del alpha h bar alpha mu. The last term again is a four divergence del beta h bar beta alpha. All of those terms would go to zero in the new coordinate system, which means the g prime mu nu that I write down will have just one term surviving, which is going to be minus half del alpha del alpha h bar prime mu nu. You must also keep in mind that these derivatives are also taken in the x prime coordinate system. Observe that it is this condition that the h bar prime in the new coordinate system x prime mu obeys is what helped us to reduce the form of Einstein tensor to such a simple form, simple one. This condition is very similar to the Lorentz gauge condition seen in electromagnetism, which helps us to reduce the form of Maxwell's equation to that of a wave equation. In the context of general relativity, this condition also is known under a couple of other names, one of which is a harmonic gauge the other de Donder gauge, de Donder gauge. So we can say that with the choice of Lorentz gauge, we have managed to reduce Einstein tensor to such a simple form. Now, if Einstein tensor has been reduced to such a simple form, then naturally the Einstein equations have got reduced to a simple form. Now the Einstein equation takes the form minus half del alpha del alpha h bar prime mu nu being equal to minus 8 pi g t prime mu nu, where t prime mu nu is the form of the energy momentum tensor in the new coordinate system. Cancelling away the signs and taking the factor of 2 to the other side, we could write it as del alpha del alpha h bar prime mu nu equal to 16 pi g t prime mu nu.
in so far we were working in units where in which speed of light had was dimensionless and had value 1 now we will choose a new unit in which we keep the speed of light to be dimensionless and at value 1 in addition we will also choose the newton's gravitational constant also to be dimensionless and with value 1 this choice of units often called geometrized or geometric units geometric geometrized units or geometric units at times in geometrized units einstein equation would take the form del alpha del alpha h bar prime nu nu equal to 16 pi t prime nu nu to arrive at this form of the einstein's equation we have only made use of the fact that the gravitational field that we are considering is a weak gravitational field however the newtonian approximation that we are finally interested in is concerned with gravitational field that are not only weak but also time independent or static as we call it in addition to the fact that the matter distribution that is associated with it is slow moving compared to the speed of light since we are considering the matter to be a fluid in this case we can say that it's a slow moving fluid whose energy momentum tensor that we are concerned with in the case of newtonian approximation for slow moving fluid we know that for all the components out of the, all the components of the energy momentum tensor the zero zeroth component is the biggest in fact when this fluid moves at a velocity is much smaller than the velocity of light which is taken to be one here we can see that all other components are much smaller than one and especially compared with the zero zeroth component and uh, can thus be set to zero in comparison with t zero zero so out of all the equations that we will consider the inhomogeneous part of that equation which appears on the right hand side of the equation will be non-zero for a slow moving fluid when we are considering the zero zeroth component alone all other components can be approximately taken to be zero to comment about the relative magnitudes of the quantity on the left hand side we have to first consider the condition that the metric has to be static metric if the metric is static where these components cannot depend on time then the quantity on, of the on the left hand side will be such that every time it we get a time derivative of the quantity we can set it to zero thus the left hand side reduces to del square the Laplacian of h bar prime mu nu equal to 16 pi t prime mu nu Let us now consider such a gravitational field in empty space, vacuum.
this would be the case, for instance, at a, at a few hundred kilometers from the surface of the Earth, where the atmosphere is also absent. In such a situation, we would expect no kind of energy or matter distribution to exist. Thus, the equation would reduce to basically the Laplace equation. Solution to such a Laplace equation is well known. It is known to be of the form h bar prime mu nu to some constant tensor eta mu nu divided by r where r is the radial coordinate in spherical polar coordinate system xi xi. Now since the quantity h bar prime which is of this form must also satisfy the Lorentz gauge condition, we could see what type of restriction it imposes on the a mu nu's. We could substitute this into the Lorentz gauge condition and see that del mu of h bar prime mu nu which will turn out to be of the form del i of h bar prime i nu because each of the h bar prime is time independent when mu takes value 0, the corresponding term vanishes and we are left with only terms involving the spatial derivatives. And such terms would immediately result in A i nu times x i by r. So this is what the left hand side of the Lorentz gauge condition says and since the Lorentz gauge condition must be satisfied in this choice of coordinate, this must be equal to 0. Now this Lorentz gauge condition can be satisfied only if a mu nu components would vanish whenever either mu or nu take spatial values that is for all components of the form a i 0 and all components of the form a i j where i and j takes spatial values 1 2 3. Thus we conclude that in Lorentz gauge the only significant component would be a 0 0 component and thus the only significant component of only non zero component of h bar primes should also be the 0 0 component since we have already seen that for a slow moving fluid it's the t 0 0 component that will be the, the only significant component, the Einstein equation would reduce to a form del square of h bar prime 0 0 equal to 16 pi t prime 0 0. Now remember h bar prime mu nu was h prime mu nu minus half of eta mu nu times 
h prime where h prime was a term mu nu h prime mu nu then h prime bar zero zeros would be h prime zero zero times or minus half times eta zero zero into h bar h prime using this form of h prime bar zero zero in here we could write the einstein equation in terms of the metric component especially in terms of the h zero zero component remember we had found that h prime zero zero was nothing but eta zero alpha eta zero beta h prime alpha beta which is in fact equal to h prime zero zero that being the only non-zero term in this sum similarly we can also show that h prime i i is the same as h prime i i using these two we could compute what is h prime h prime by definition is eta alpha beta h prime alpha beta which as we know by making use of the non-zero components of eta alpha beta are eta zero zero h prime zero zero plus eta i i h prime i i where i again runs over the spatial values the coordinates one two and three eta zero zero being minus one the first term gives us minus h prime zero zero while the remaining terms are all positive giving us h prime 1 1 plus h prime 2 2 plus h prime 3 3 but for a weak and static gravitational field we had earlier observed that the values of h 0 0 as well as h prime 1 1 2 2 as well as 3 3 are all equal to minus 2 5 this means that this sum will give us four times five minus four times five using this as well as this fact that h prime contravariant zero zero is equal to that equal to h prime zero zero we could now find that the value of this is just minus four times five. we could use this in the Einstein equation and also make use of the fact that t prime zero zero in our units could be chosen as minus of the mass density rho we could write the Einstein equation in the form del square phi equal to 4 pi rho which is exactly what the Newton's law of gravitation would tell us so this indeed confirms that Einstein equation reduces or reproduces Newton's law of gravitation in the appropriate limit. <laughs>